Hello, uh, thank you for joining me. Today we are talking to uh, Captain Andy O'Shea, who's co-founder of the Airline Pilot Club, along with uh, Peter Hornfeld, or better known as Mentor Pilot. He uh, runs a consultancy working with airlines and ATOs, and uh, is probably best known for, amongst many of you, for being the head of training for Ryanair for 18 years, uh, during which time he probably oversaw something like 10,000 type ratings going through. So he knows a thing or two about pilot training and about pilot careers. Andy, how are you doing? Very well, very well. Still dealing with uh, lockdown procedures, but uh, getting on with it, you know, plenty to do and the family's well, so that's the main thing. You, that's you know. main thing yeah. Where, where about are you at the moment? Where am I speaking to you? We're in Dublin and uh, very fortunate, we're just on the coastline here in Dublin Bay, so we've got plenty of places to go and things to do uh, within the regulations. And um, I must say, six weeks, eight weeks into it now, you know, it's it's been fine. It's been fine. Yeah, and I just nobody want... that we know, uh, nobody that we know has been affected by the virus or uh, damaged by it. So, you know, that's the most important thing as well, I think. So. Yeah. Apologies for the sirens. I live in a little village in the middle of Wiltshire. We don't often get sirens, so no. I'm guessing that someone's had a walk that was five minutes too long or something like that. Right. Um, so I guess what what prompted this was a was was a blog post that you wrote um, on on the yeah. Airline Pilot Club website recently, which I was reading, which I, I kind of really appreciate. I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit more about it. I wonder if we could start at, start at the beginning. Hey, that's novel, isn't it? Um, with, with your uh, Control the controllables, which is a yeah. phrase. Where, where did that come from? Well, um, as I said, somebody who's very dear to me um, found herself in a situation where she needed just a little bit of help. And uh, I was thinking in terms of how I might do that without, you know, being overbearing or anything like that and try to put a structure on it. And the, the phrase popped into my mind. I'm certain I'd, I'm certain I'd heard it uh, previously, but... Um, since I used it with this person, it's been attributed to me amongst a small group of people, and it's a bit of a joke now. But control the controllables. I think, it, as I said in the piece, it's a great philosophy, you know, because it gives you back a sense of control over what's going on, and it actually challenges you to take action. You know, there's a call to action there. And it, 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 it also challenges you to examine the... Um, the aspects of the situation that you do have control over and invariably you have got assets you've got resources that can be activated to help you in any situation i mean when we're talking about this scene i'm always uh, reminded of our crm training to do with stress you know and uh, when people are stressed one of the most important things to do is to try and take action against it and in doing so you know you get that sense of control back and uh, things start to improve make a list <laughs> work your way through it and uh, eventually things get better and that's what happened in the case of this lovely person that i knew excellent oh, that's, that's good and i guess yeah, applying that to applying that to today's situation wherever you are in the you know particularly if you're in that pathway for an airline career is uh it must feel like there's an awful lot of uncontrollables that you can't control so, so addressing the ones that you can has got to be a positive move yeah yeah, I mean, and it's not just the unfortunate trainees or people who've been hoping, dreaming to become a pilot at the moment. It's it's everybody in the industry, you know, from, from CEOs to, you know, the maintenance people, pilots, cabin crew, commercial, marketing, insurance. All these people are uh, in a state of chassis, as they used to say. And, uh, you know, I just thought that writing that piece, that um, the phrase popped into my mind, and then that gave me a chance to think about, well, what what are the things under our control as an industry? Now, I suppose the phrase industry, I've used a pretty broad brush because I've included uh, the regulators in there. But, you know, my experience of uh, working with the regulators has always been very positive. Uh, and I have another hat on that you didn't mention in the introduction. I'm a chairman of a thing called the Air Crew Training Policy Group, and we work very closely with the ASA. And you know they're working really hard to try and uh, to try and fix as in as much as they can and help in as much as they can the situation. And so far, I'd have to say I think they're doing a good job. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and that's where I came up with that list of five. Thanks. And so the, the the first the first one uh, that was was about research, return to service regulations. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I think I was talking to people today and 
you know, with Ryanair coming out today with the news that they did and British Air is coming out recently in the last few days with their news, like we're pretty close to the bottom in terms of the bad news cycle, I think. And um fingers crossed. From the from the bottom, there's only one way up. And 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 I just I just feel there's one more tripwire out there that, that could cause the industry a lot of problems, and that is how we decide to crank it back up and get the return to service uh, protocols and policies and procedures um, into place, you know. And and in that that number that item on the the list, I was just reflecting on how important it is that that the regulators talk to industry, the experienced people in the industry. And listen to them with an open mind because there are in situations like this we've seen it before where you know an external shock happens or something literally shocking happens in the industry and there's a reaction and sometimes the reaction doesn't produce exactly what was envisaged when people sat in a room figuring out how are we going to fix this mm. so, i mean one uh, instance would be the the requirement for 1500 hours um, in the United States of America, before a pilot can become uh, a co-pilot on a carrier, that was that was a, a kind of political input, and so I'd hate if, in this current situation, we have any of that uh, input into what should be a technical decision, and 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 it's a decision that should be, in many ways, provided to the operator to come up with a solution, because as always, they're the best people to uh, to know. They know what's what their equipment is, they know what their training is, they know what their people are capable of. They need expert advice, certainly. But if you think of this wonderful thing that we all have, uh, which is a safety management system, it's a requirement, uh, and it should be a well-oiled machine at this stage in all the uh, commercial air traffic operators that we, we can think of. You know, the SMS, as it's known, should have a very strong role to play in the uh, return to service process. Because no aircraft is the same, the routes aren't the same, um, and there are other variables, and there are mitigations that could be brought into play within that space, within that process, that could do a lot of good, um, give people the reassurance they want and they need, uh, look after the, the health situation, which is an imperative, but also give this industry of ours a chance to get back up there on its feet and uh, do what it does, which is move people around, um, and, and and make some money because it's a business and so many people are employed in that uh, industry. It's it's remarkable now that we see the numbers. Yeah. So I think, I think I mean, I don't want to attribute any policy to them, but I think I saw something from EasyJet who were considering removing the one, one seat per row or something. I mean, that, that's well, a lot of capacity. I would be very surprised if, a, um, if an operator volunteered to do that. That's yeah. all on that. Yeah. Very, um, you know, if you take three percent of a uh, of a, a an industry stock in trade off the shelf and tell people that you can't sell it, as I mean, Michael has Michael O'Leary has spoken about this, and you can't run a business selling sixty six percent of your your stock. Yeah. So try and find a way uh, not to do that. And there are ways that um, I'm certain uh, the medical people, the testing people, the regulatory people and industry can come together and come up with a, a useful solution, a one that doesn't further cripple the industry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not, not speaking of any individual airline at all, but, but we've all been we've all experienced that the boarding process where the, the gate's been really, really busy. There's been everyone pressed up against each other getting in a rush for seats and and everything and, and right now it's kind of hard to imagine how how that would how that would feel if it was happening again do you do you think it's something that will people will get over relatively quickly and, and forget about or do you think it's something that's do you think we're going to change the way we behave for quite a while now oh i think we have to think about this in a medium to long-term change program yeah i mean um i think that the social distancing for as long as it's necessary um will be imposed and, and required um, and welcomed by responsible people in terminals and in the aviation environment. Yeah. But, you know, when you get on the aircraft, um, all the precautions should have taken place beforehand and there should be mitigations on the aircraft, such as 
masks, gloves, training, reduce service, maybe consider not uh, serving alcohol in the, uh, in, the, in the terminal or in the aircraft to ensure that we have good behavior. And, you know, <clears throat> there's many, many things that you can think of that could do a good job rather than saying just, you know, take out the, uh, the middle row. That's, that's a very extreme solution to... Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on. Um, the, next, the next one in your list was pilot requirements. And I think over the last few years, we've all been kind of getting used to the annual Boeing announcement saying, you know, we're going to need another 300,000 pilots, six, whatever the number was, an ever-growing number of pilots and technicians, the, the pilot and technician training outlook, which just seemed impossible, a, a number that was impossible to meet. Um, and I think your, your argument is that we need those figures, whether they're, high figures or low figures or it doesn't really matter we just need to know what they are is, is that a correct interpretation yeah that's absolutely it i mean you know everybody that i know has been working to those figures um the commission in europe and uh, the asa industry all the training industry have been gearing up for it uh the 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 the, the, the manufacturers have been taking the orders and the production lines were in uh, in full flow um so you know, obviously that has changed and we know that there are going to be, uh, there's going to be uh, a recovery period and depending on the things that we have control over and, and others, you know, uh, we're still very much in, in control of the, of the virus. Uh, we, we don't know enough about its uh, reinfection rates or the, the effective antibodies. We don't know how far out of a vaccine we are. So there's lots of stuff we can't control, but certainly, <laughs> um, there's absolutely no reason why the clever people in Boeing, CAE and Airbus who have the logarithms, who understand the variables that go into coming up with that figure, which was bountiful in the first place, will surely be a little bit less in the short term when it's reworked. But we need that certainty, or at least something that has a semblance of certainty in this uh, very, very difficult time. And, you know, I think that, you know, people respond well to some facts or something that looks like a fact. And so I know that CAE are working on uh, producing uh, an updated um, estimate of pilot requirements over the same time frame, and I think that's really welcome. Uh, and I think it would be great if the manufacturers did the same. So you know, the planners, the people, the kids, the, the people who want to become pilots, the resource people, they can all uh, they can all actually get their job done and uh, begin to plan and plan for that recovery which will come um yeah i mean clearly the the the, the decision for someone who, who is going to become a cadet and a with, with a view to becoming an airline pilot the you know, even if if you could train starting tomorrow which you clearly can't right now you are likely not to finish for a couple of years at least so in many ways you're trying to predict the future of the economy and the world in two years time perhaps even longer which is which is a tough thing to do um so and there are still going to be people who who are who are absolutely dedicated and driven to do that thing i suspect that airlines will not be rushing to fund uh, pilot training anytime soon and they weren't rushing to fund it particularly when they were in in desperate need of pilots mm. um, so in, in terms of funding solutions that that kind of seems like it's the the nub of the that's always that's a question that never goes away for cadets and i know that's something you've worked on with airline pilot club absolutely and uh i mean that the desire to do that came out of my involvement in that uh, uh aircrew training policy group because one of the things we did um, a few years ago was to produce a paper for the european commission called the challenge of pilot supply which uh was was a broad-ranging um paper on on and the difficulties that the industry is facing in producing the numbers of pilots that are required and to the standard that's required. And we can't forget that. No. And it became obvious in our discussions and research that, you know, getting a funding solution was the answer. And we, you know, we came up with a very simple model, um, which a 12 year old could figure out, uh, which was simply if you get the right people, through assessments, good assessments, well administered, coming into a really good ATO, good flying school. Um, and you then have an airline at the other end of the system pulling people through, offering at least an assessment uh, or better still a firm job if 
the necessary standards are achieved. You will uh, you will um, provide or, or you you loosen up the, the coffers in the banks. And what we in the pilot club have done is to work really closely with some great people in Aon. And uh, they've really bought into this and they want to make it happen. And we were so close before this virus came along, you know. But we're not, uh, we're not uh, giving up. We're going to keep going because we know a part of the solution to this uh, issue will be making sure that we've got uh, good people coming into the, into the, uh, the industry uh, for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And so um, that combination of assessment, excellent training, triggering um, financial instruments that can uh, provide a loan to the right student with an airline at the end of it saying, yes, once you qualify and you reach your standard, we will give you at least an assessment or better still a job. That will make it happen. I mean, the appetite is there. Uh, certainly in December, January, it was there. Obviously, at the moment, you know, people in grey suits are looking at the aviation industry and they're looking at a wasteland. But that will change and we will be back. And, you know, the, the aircraft will fly again and uh, we will have lots of requirement for more pilots. I, I think I said in the in the in the blog that you know there were a couple of factors going in there and you can remind me of it because you probably have it in front of you. But you know, like unfortunately people in my age, uh time moves on and people will retire. The baby boomers will move on to a point where they'll retire and they'll be very sadly missed uh with their experience and their huge contribution to safety. Not to mention the stories around the campfire, but uh the, uh, they'd be replaced by new generations. Um, we'll have some consolidation in the industry, uh, and certainly after a few years, we'll have the same number or more people flying, and that implies that the same uh, number or more of aircraft will be flown, but maybe in fewer airlines. You know. Yeah, I think you you you, you mentioned that for for those airline CEOs who who have either. Mm-hmm a stack of cash or, or an ability to raise a stack of cash it's, it's going to be a great time for them to go shopping at the moment and obviously- absolutely yeah i mean if you look at the if you look at the industry since 1999 2000 um the, the ceos who have journeyed to toulouse or seattle after 9 11 after sars after um financial crises have all done very well um, with the prices they've got uh and that has given those airlines a very strong structural cost advantage over people who bought aircraft, which is the biggest capital expenditure, uh, at a higher point in the cycle. So it would be amazing if uh, people didn't uh, approach the manufacturers at a time like this and say, we're looking to a five-year window, we're looking to a 10-year window. Yeah. Um, what can you offer us? And that will be... Um, That'll be some energy injected into the positive energy injected into the industry as well. Just as, you know, uh, we touched on the max there uh, in the blog as well. You know, I really believe that when that aircraft flies again and it's certified and uh, in the fleets that it was destined for and more aircraft roll off the production line, you know, that will be a major boost to the industry as well, because that's been kind of hanging around for a while as an issue. and. It will be great when that airplane is fixed and uh, back uh, back in the air. You know, there'll be some people at Boeing who are mightily relieved when that happens. I yes, yeah, yeah. I know some of them. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, I, I can uh, imagine. Uh, and of course, the the other thing that you mentioned in the blog is, is that at the moment, um, fuel is cheap. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's very cheap at the moment. And, of course, that has hurt a lot of airlines who's, who'd hedged out uh, yeah. during the year and they're committed to purchasing that fuel at that price. But um, it looks like the, the, the price of fuel will be, uh, as I said in the piece, affordable. I'm not predicting where it'll be. I'm not that clever. But it, it should be affordable for uh, the operators. And I think anything that gives the operators a little bit of relief on the cost side um, uh, will help the operators that survive and continue and might even uh, offer some hope to some startups because there are always optimists in the aviation industry and uh, that's why we have such a vibrant place to work and live as a group of people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, fi- finally, I guess, if we begin to, you know, if we begin to see um, 
a structured return to normality along with operating procedures and um, some people have predicted that as airlines start flying again there will be a bit of a price war in order to encourage people back in. i mean who knows whether that's going to happen or not but as you mentioned brexit and the also so there's the there's the possibility that just as things are getting better, just as things are looking like they're going to get back on track, along comes this unicorn. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was yeah. saying a about it. Along comes Brexit, let's just say. Um, yeah. To, to add another layer of complexity on, on an already tough 2020. Very tough. Yeah. And, you know, I'm looking at it from a perspective. I'm not in the airline industry anymore, per se. We put a massive amount of work into preparing for Brexit in Ryanair. Uh, we've got a, a UK-based airline now, uh, um, overseen by the, the CAA, the UK CAA. But I don't know one aviation person or expert uh, in the UK, and there are so many wonderful people in that group. I don't know one of them who thinks that leaving the ass is a good idea. and. Uh, I need to be careful, but I was just amazed when uh, that gentleman started talking about the, the great future of involved in urban mobility vehicles or whatever they call them. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it's just it's just strange, Ian, that uh, that this self inflicted wound I think is being is being brought upon us. You know, well, it, it feels a little bit like we've we have the we have the COVID wounds. Um, and we're just going to deliver me some salt. I just need to rub it in a little bit. <laughs> I need to shut up now because I'm an Irish guy and not allowed to talk about Brexit. I swore I'd leave him alone. But yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation to, to observe. And uh, like the pilot training industry, very, uh, very, it's a huge part of, uh, of what the UK has contributed to, uh, to European aviation in terms of standards, output, hardware, thinking, uh, innovation. It's been fantastic, you know. Um, and that's not going to go away. But, I mean, as somebody who worked so hard to try and simplify uh, administrative procedures and just make things easy for people, just watching this unfold is just very interesting to to do. So, Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, we probably better stop. I, I'm, I'm yeah, sure. don't, don't leave me like this, please. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to get a few emails, probably. But anyway, yeah, me too. Um, me, me, moving on from that, I guess. So, so if there's, if you could, if you could, if you could sum all of that together from the blog, what what would you be saying to you know? I, I don't know whether you have any nieces or no. actually, I do thinking about it. Um, but if you had someone, else, if you were advising your neighbours, uh son or daughter about yeah. a career in aviation how, how would you sum that up at the yeah. moment well this is somebody who i have huge respect for in the in the industry and um a, a phrase that she uses another lady is that um you should when there are no jobs you should be training so that when there are jobs you're trained and so for people going into uh thinking of going into training right now it's actually not a bad time because, as you mentioned, the time frame, the training cycle will take you 18 months uh, forward, at least maybe two years. And at that stage, um, we'll be well out of the valley and the industry will be in full recovery mode, I believe. Um, so, so I would say uh, keep doing what you're doing um, work towards your goals work towards uh, providing yourself with the funds obviously that's so important do whatever you can to stay active in the in the industry at whatever level you can in your flying club or your association or university or whatever yeah. and believe it because the time will come i think uh, as i said in, in the piece or actually in, in the linkedin thing that i did um two years seems like an eternity to to people but actually it's not and we got through this very quickly and then once that curve picks up it's going to be extremely steep and the people who are in position and trained and ready to go will benefit and uh, the people who are most simply for are the people who are kind of halfway through to just qualify they're they're the ones who uh, will probably find it more difficult but in terms of 
people looking at it, uh, should I start? I think there's absolutely no doubt that by the time you're trained, you will have um, a future as an airline pilot. Yeah, I think it's, you know, and I think we, we did some seminars at, at some of the shows that we did um, and we're talking to some pilots and there was a couple of people who'd gone the modular route and they, they'd managed to delay or plan, not to delay, they slowed their progress so that they finished at a specific time. They adjusted right. their, their their training really so that, so, and so to a certain extent, you know, really it's, it's going to, you are looking at two, somewhere between two and almost five or six years if you want to do that that way. So yeah. You just need yeah. to make sure. I, you know, personally, I think you just need to make sure you've got a plan A, plan B, and plan C. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing is, you know, like could you get into a little bit more detail? You know, I, I know this is something that we, in, myself and Peter, and in, in the Ireland Pilot Club, we've been banging on about. But like, choose your ATO wisely. You know, um, sure you've got a quality ATO. Make sure the ATO has some sort of a track record of providing people to an airline that's likely to be around or prosper. In the future landscape you know uh, there are things that you can control coming back to that you can you can control where you spend your hard-earned cash on your pilot training and uh, if you choose wisely um you know a good outcome will happen i don't want to plug the the club but that's what we're about you know that's what we want to do is to provide that kind of guidance and service to people um so that when they do part with their cash and they invest in their training that they are dealing with only the best ATOs out there. There are quite a lot of early critical decisions to be taken at a time when you're relatively new in the industry um, and don't have a, a don't have a, a, a lifetime career to, to draw on. So getting those well, that, right is important. Yeah, uh, that's one of the motivations behind Peter and myself getting together and trying to do this thing. Um, we're in, we're in pretty good shape despite the the shocks that we've had to absorb, and uh, you know we're moving forward with our plans to open the website in its normal mode. At the moment, we're in a kind of COVID nineteen mode, which produces yeah. videos that uh, you talked to Petra about, I know, and also the blog, and a couple of other things. We've got some free English language courses going out there as well, and uh, it's been good for us to get into the process of running the website and listening to people. Um, but I think it'll probably be a month or two before we get uh, up and running in the way that we had had hoped with an announcements about um, teaming up with ATOs, uh, this concept called the indicative assessment, which we've uh, developed with Aon, and also again with Aon, um, an insurance policy, a really powerful insurance policy for people's training uh, costs, which then when they qualify automatically turns into um, a loss of license uh, insurance policy. So. These are the type of things that we're trying to put in place that are responsible, that I don't think have been there too much before and um, will help people. But I mean, the big kahuna obviously is the funding and we'll need uh, a little bit more certainty in the marketplace before uh, the banks would be excited about lending into people training uh, to be a pilot just at the moment. But we're still working very hard on a totally committed to it. So I think it'll happen all right. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Before before we go, just a, a quick chat. Are you, are you missing the flying? No, I have to say, uh, I'll be honest and say I'm not. Um, I had kind of, I'd been absorbed by the managerial side of things uh, for such a long time uh, that I kind of got out of step with the flying. And um, yeah, I'm more into, uh, God help me, the management side of things now than the actual joy of flying an airplane but you never know something strange might happen i get back into an aircraft one of these days if you, if, if you ever come over to the uk we'll, we'll t and we can we'll take the 182 and uh, oh. around. it'll be a different kind of flying but you know it's flying well, don't, don't give it to me to land i think <laughs> probably round out at about 100 feet or something like that yeah oh well never mind <laughs> Brilliant. well thank you very much for that andy um pleasure as as things progress throughout the year and, and as things change and hope hopefully for the better, perhaps we can do this again and and, and look back and, and see how see how the outlooks change for things. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, delighted to be associated with your uh, your project, Ian. It's great. So well done yourself. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on. So if you enjoyed that, if you found it useful, please give us some likes, leave a comment, 
subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, all that usual, hit the bell, all that stuff. So that would be great. So finally, thank you very much again. Stay safe um, and, and keep working as you are for the benefit of all of us in, in aviation, commercial or otherwise. Thanks.